All right, we've taken a look at the overview of the, of the 12. We have uh, wrestled with the major issue of the day, which is the 12, one book or 12, and uh, have said that uh, we would lean toward the fact that uh, as within the Masoretic tradition and uh, the earliest Jewish tradition that we see, from the 2nd century B.C. on that, uh, uh, that we view the 12 as one book in the same way that we have collections of oracles from different dates by the prophets in the first three of the latter prophets. So in, in the 12... We finally have God's messenger, very possibly Malachi, who not only gives his own word, but also brings together the word of the prophets that has gone before, and uh, it comes together as, as a book. But since we can't be sure, and obviously in the end there is uh, you know, no biblical statement like we have for the Torah that says this is one unitary unit, that uh, certainly... Uh, historically, particularly within the Christian tradition, the books have been studied as individual units. And uh, that's what we will, we will do, and yet as we go through, try to uh, see how there is a very definite uh, development, thematic development that is taking place within the, uh, the 12 as, as a whole. And so we come to the, the first of the individual sections, or if you want to call this way, the individual books that uh, make up the 12, and that is the book of Hosea. And uh, it's very easy as you read through the 14 chapters of Hosea to be able to pick up the major themes. Uh, just a very illustration, example, that is given to us in chapters 1 and 3. Uh, from Hosea's experience, we believe, his own personal experience that he is writing here in a narrative fashion shows that he had to deal with an adulterous wife. He had to deal with a promiscuous woman and uh, uh, went through his own family turmoil that uh, Yahweh used to say, all right, in the same way that Hosea's wife has been unfaithful to him, Israel, and Hosea is a prophet to the northern kingdom, that, uh, that Israel has been an adulterous uh, wife to Yahweh. And uh, so the the aspect of the spiritual adultery of Israel that uh, flows out of Hosea's example. And uh, if there's one thing that everyone agrees on when we get to literary structure, it is that the first three chapters give the example and chapters four on, give the exposition that flows out of Hosea's example within his own marriage. But uh, we can see that the concept of adultery and I've listed the verses for you there in chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 9, continues on as you go through the, the oracles, the, the, the exposition that is seen within the last 11 chapters of Hosea. And yet, and Hosea uh, certainly gives a tremendous uh, balance as we, we go through because uh, we also have uh, the... The places where Hosea makes it very, very clear that uh, God is going to bring a future salvation for Israel, a future deliverance. And uh, we will see very definitely that uh, Hosea makes it very, very clear through all that is taking place. In fact, three times as he gives his introduction, uh, that is the first three chapters, and then three times Within the collected oracles, we see that he will speak about the future salvation of Israel. And so the purpose is very clear to see, though Israel was unfaithful, Yahweh's faithful love will prevail. And uh, particularly in the sense that his faithful love will prevail to bring deliverance to 
Israel in the future. As I said, as far as the, as the um, basic literary structure of Hosea is concerned, there is very, very little debate on this. We have a title to the oracles, which uh, as we have already seen from the three previous latter prophets, uh, emphasizes here uh, Hosea. Hosea has told us, is, we are told, is the son of uh, Be'eri. Uh, we find that the word of the Lord comes to him. He is the instrument of the message. And it takes place, and notice he lists the kings of Judah first. Even though he's going to speak to the northern kingdom, it is during the days of Uzziah through Hezekiah. And, uh, and yet says, during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Jehosh, king of Israel. And of course, his reign comes to an end in 752 B.C. And uh, yet, uh, with, uh, with Hezekiah, uh, this comes really all the way down to the, to the time of uh, Israel's uh, captivity in 722 B.C. So broadly, we categorize his ministry from about 760, 755 B.C., probably when the events that are recorded in chapter 1 occur, and then on the basis of what takes place, uh, Hosea speaks his message. And, uh, and yet it begins in the days of Jeroboam. And this is important because Jeroboam II is the, the king who extended the borders of Israel to their greatest extent during the Old Testament period. In fact, uh, his uh, northern ter ter territory expanded almost to the extent of uh, Solomon's. And uh, also, during, uh, during Jeroboam's time, uh, the, uh, during those approximately 40 years, from uh, 795 to 755 B.C., Israel had its greatest economic wealth and uh, its greatest political clout within the ancient Near East. And, uh, of course, it's against that backdrop that Hosea is going to begin his ministry with the fact that even though on the outside everything looks good, on the inside the rot of spiritual adultery is taking its toll. And then we have the marriage of Hosea, which we'll come back to in the interpretive issues. But uh, here we see the example is Goma, the wife of Hosea, who we see within these chapters is the unfaithful wife of Hosea. Everyone agrees with that, that very definitely uh, Goma falls into adultery. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, the interpretive uh, problems uh, with that as we uh, get into to those issues, but... But, and whether in chapter 3 we have a different woman or the same woman, but uh, certainly Goma is presented to us very, very definitely in 1-2 as a wife of harlotry who brings forth children of har harlotry. That is, not children who are harlots, but children who come through a woman who is a harlot. And uh, the command for Hosea to marry this woman is uh, because in verse 2, the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking Yahweh. That uh, Hosea's marriage is going to be an example of what is taking place in Israel's relationship to, to Yahweh. So here is Goma, the unfaithful wife of Hosea. She is introduced to us early in 1-2 as an example of Israel. And so in chapter 4 through 14, we have the message of Hosea that gives us the exposition of Israel, the unfaithful wife of Yahweh. And so here we see the two major divisions of the book, the marriage of Hosea as the basis of the message of Hosea uh, in the latter part of, of the book. Now, to take a look at the, uh, the structure, we'll, uh, we'll bring this uh, before us uh, because we want to 
look at the interpretive uh, issues of, uh, of, the, of the book. But uh, as uh, we put Jose, and I will do this to see if we can do some. Now, we won't be able to do any technological wizardry at this point. But uh, uh, here are the first uh, three chapters. Let me just make a quick statement about the bibliography in Hosea, and then we'll talk about these uh, two interpretive issues that emerge out of this, uh, this section. Uh, you will not usually see me recommending the Anchor Bible. Uh, the Anchor Bible is uh, usually a fairly uh, liberal uh, interaction with uh, the Scripture, and uh, and uh, though uh, most of the volumes are uh, not worthy of your investment because of other things that are available, uh, Hosea is is not one of those. Uh, Hosea in the Anchor Bible today is uh, the most extensive uh, exegetical work that is available on this portion of the Twelve. Some by Francis uh, Anderson, who is, uh, who is a broad evangelical scholar, and uh, David Noel Friedman, who is in theology neo-Orthodox, but uh, actually uh, exegetically is somewhat conservative himself. Remember, Karl Barth himself was conservative in some elements as far as uh, the scripture is concerned. And, uh, and Anderson and Freeman do see this book as being a unit that, uh, though probably not written by Jose himself or collected by Jose himself, goes back to Hosea's messages. And, uh, and uh, because of uh, Anderson's evangelical background, they uh, certainly uh, interact with uh, conservative, previous conservative works upon the book as well as uh, liberal uh, uh, volumes as well. Uh, they've also written a work on Amos. They've also written a work on Micah. I recommend uh, Amos. I have not looked at Micah to, uh, to see if it meets the standards that have been set in these, these other volumes. So um, all... <clears throat> All multiple authored series will have their ups and downs. And, uh, and uh, the Anchor Bible has a lot of downs. This happens to be one of the ups uh, that is uh, within that series. And, uh, and uh, really that work came out in the early 80s and uh, has uh, really uh, <clears throat> uh, determined Hosean studies since that point that uh, commentators usually begin with interact, interacting with Anderson and Friedman who brought together the, the different positions and uh, interacted with them quite extensively. Probably the best work to have on your, your shelf is Garrett's work in the NAC. You get Jose and Joel for the price of uh, one volume. Hubbard's work in the Tyndale is a, <clears throat> is a, uh, a good medium level commentary as well. One of the the better works in the, uh, the Tyndale series. And I, I give you Kidner, as you can see. For, I, I don't have this before you, I realize. I should probably put that back up there so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but uh, uh, Kidner is uh, broadly evangelical, ah, mill. But uh, there really aren't that many other works on, on, uh, on Hosea, preaching uh, type work on Hosea. So uh, at least it gives you some... Uh, some broad perspective uh, as you begin to preach this portion of, of the 12. Well, let's come to the interpretive uh, issues, the interpretive problems. Before we discuss the problems per se, let's take a look at the first uh, three chapters of uh, Hosea. And uh, <clears throat> Hosea verses uh, 2 through 9 of chapter 1 is written for us in narrative style. As Hosea speaks of how the Lord's word came to him and in response how he marries Gomer and uh, bears him a son and then she conceived and gave birth to a daughter and then conceived and gave birth to a 
second son. And the names that were given, Jezreel, Lo Ruhamah, and, uh, and Lo Hami. And uh, these names are, are given as indications, just as we've already seen in Isaiah chapter 7 and 8, that uh, children are given names that have, have uh, some kind of uh, prophetic significance. Well, this is true about uh, these three children. Jezreel is a reminder of uh, Jehu, obviously the founder of the house of Jehu, of which Jeroboam will be will be his most illustrious uh, king. And uh, yet, even though God had called Jehu to destroy the house of Omri and the worship of Baal, uh, he does two things wrong. The first thing is he, he takes the slaughter much further than God has intended. And uh, second of all, though eradicating the northern kingdom of the worship of Baal in official capacity, he reestablishes the, uh, the worship of Jeroboam. And as we read in Hosea, we see that elements of Baalism are still left in the worship of Jeroboam the first, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the unfaithful worship of Yahweh through the, uh, the system of Jeroboam the first. And uh, so Jezreel is a reminder that God is going to judge the house of Omri and also the kingdom of Israel because of the sins of Jehu. Uh, then we see Lo Ruhamah, which means no compassion for for Yahweh will no longer have compassion upon Israel, that I should ever forgive them. But at that time, there would be compassion upon Judah, that uh, they will be delivered, but not Israel. So here the implication is the people who will come to destroy the northern kingdom because God will have no compassion upon them. At that point, compassion will be shown to Judah. And of course, historically, we know that, out, that the outworking of that was Assyria that destroyed the northern kingdom, but God did uh, bring deliverance during the time of Hezekiah. And that's why Hezekiah is in the superscription that uh, Hosea's uh, message was, uh, went into Hezekiah's day and their deliverance. And then finally, Lohami. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet, having spoken about these three elements of judgments, chapter 1, verse 10, through chapter 2, verse 1, say that this is not God's final word. Because he goes on in verse uh, 10, Yet the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea. Right, with all the judgment that is coming, behind it is still the Abrahamic covenant that God will remember. So that uh, in the, the future, uh, God is going to reverse the judgments. And in verse 11, the, the, the sons of Judah, the sons of Israel, will be gathered together, and they will appoint for themselves one leader. All right, again, emphasizing the fact that there's going to be one leader that goes before it. And, of course, in chapter 3, we're going to see that is, once again, the, the house of David. And they will go from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So the judgment is going to be overturned. A judgment upon the house of Jay, who is going to be overturned in a future day, when Israel will once again respond to the one leader along with Judah. And so it will be that uh, they will become once again God's people and God will once again show to them compassion. And so in verse 1 of chapter 2, say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Rahomah. So that uh, this is going to be reversed by God's restoration in the future. And then having 
spoken in narrative, and yet the restoration is in poetry. He then turns once again and gives a long poetic interlude here in chapter 2 through verse 23. And in verses 2 to 13, he again contends. Contend with your mother, contend, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. And as you begin this, you start to wonder, okay, is Hosea speaking about his wife or is this Yahweh speaking about his wife? And in the end, we find out that it is, having seen the example of Hosea, it is Yahweh speaking about his wife, his wife Israel. And uh, the fact that uh, because of her adultery, he is putting her away for a time. And, uh, and yet, beginning in verse 14, now as, as his divorced wife, he will once again begin to court her and woo her and bring her back to himself and will be betrothed to her in the future. Now, verse 17, I will remove the name of the Baals from her mouth, so they will not be mentioned by their names no more. In that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, etc. And I will betroth you, verse 19, to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then they will know Yahweh. And so Hosea says, all right, now God as the jilted husband... Yahweh as the, as the faithful husband who has, uh, who has had to suffer the unfaithfulness of his bride and so has put his wife aside and uh, yet in the future will woo her and remarry her. Even though she for, for many many days has, uh, has given herself over to adultery. Uh, the term of betrothal is, is never used because one of the debates is, well, how does this fit into Deuteronomy chapter 24? And uh, though she was uh, vastly unfaithful in the end, uh, she is uh, wooed and brought back in righteousness and faithfulness to Yahweh in the future. And so having seen this interlude with Yahweh's relationship with Israel, in chapter 3 we go back to Hosea's relationship with a woman who we believe is, is Goma. And, uh, and once again in verses uh, 1 to 4 we see the judgment where, where Hosea goes and buys the woman loved by her husband, yet an adulteress. And in verse 3, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not pay the harlot, nor have a man. So I'll also be toward you. The purchase has taken place. But uh, Hosea, at this point, does not betroth the, the woman. And this is an indication in verse 4 that the sons of Israel remain for many days without king or prince. And yet afterward, here is the word of restoration, the sons of Israel, verse 5, will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. And so here we see chapter 1, the marriage and children of Hosea, chapter 3, the remarriage of Hosea, with at the end of his statement about his marriage, the, the indication of a future restoration, and at the end of the narrative of his remarriage, again a statement of restoration in the future, and in between, showing the close connection, is Hosea's relationship is a mirror to Yahweh's relationship with the, uh, with the nation. Now, at, at that point, all right, there's no great amount, again, of, of debate, just a reading of the text. 
sees, uh, sees that, that Hosea's uh, marriage is, a, is an example, is an illustration, foundational to what his message was. But uh, throughout the history of Judaism and Christian interpretation, the issue of Goma, if we could put it this way, would the real Goma please stand up? And, uh, and I know you haven't read Calvin and E.J. Young, but, uh, but the whole concept that Yahweh would command Hosea to marry a woman who either was inclined to or became an adulteress is, uh, well, the great moral problem of the book. And uh, so really, the majority position throughout the ages of Judaism and Christianity is to say it never really happened. It is a vision or a parable or a allegory. It is... It is something that Hosea either saw or it was, as we've already seen from Ezekiel at times, he can speak uh, certain parabolic uh, statements or be taken in vision and see something. Uh, uh, our uh, Protestant exegetes would not, of course, call this an allegory. But they would see it as either a vision or a parable. And as you can see, you've got, and I give you two great names there, of men who have taken that position. So that uh, Hosea is either seeing in a vision or is announcing a parable. He never really went through this, but he is speaking as though he did so that we can come to grips with uh, how depraved, how just morally, uh, 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 as a moral abomination was Israel's relationship to Yahweh as Hosea is, is speaking. Well, my answer to that would be nice try, but, and I've already stated chapter 1, verses uh, 2 through 9, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, are written in, in prose. They are written as narrative. And, uh, and as you, you read it, there is nothing within the text that would say it didn't happen. When, when Ezekiel had a vision, he tells us what? The Spirit took me in vision and I saw. Or if he's giving a parable, he says, now... All right, I speak in a parable. I, you know, I, I present, you know, this, uh, this example. He, well, he literally did lay on his side, but, you know, he, he is talking. And as we go through, we can see, okay, that's what happened. That's what, that's what he saw. That's, you know, this is a, a parable, an insight that God gave to him. This is uh, Mashal. This, this is an example, you know, from this realm to bringing a spiritual uh, relationship. And, of course, we see that within the names of the children. But, you know, we don't read Isaiah chapter 7 of Isaiah going to Ahaz and taking his son and all that takes place there and say, well, that is a vision. That's a parable. Because the son has a name that symbolizes, you know, something that God is, uh, is going to be, to be doing. It's literal. And uh, the same thing, I think, is true here. Well, in contemporary works, as you can see, everything that I have recommended to you, as far as contemporary commentators, take Goma as a real woman who is really married to Hosea. This is talking about a real historical woman and real historical events that take place. 
But having said that, that also does not resolve the problem. Because in verse 2 of chapter 1, Hosea is told by the Lord, Yahweh said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of harlotry. It is a woman who will be an adulteress, who will prostitute herself. Now, right away, we get into what kind of a prostitute. Is this just saying that she prostituted herself religiously? That uh, she really wasn't a harlot in the fact that she had other husbands, but uh, she, being an unfaithful Israelite, went and worshipped the Baals and worshipped the, uh, the false gods. She was a wife of harlotry in that way. And certainly, Hosea, beginning in chapter 4, will use that terminology. In fact, he actually talks about it in chapter 2, that, uh, that the mother has played the harlot, speaking about Israel and their, their relationship with the, uh, the gods other than, than Yahweh. And so some have said, well, at this point, she was, she was just a, a religiously harlotrous woman. But notice, notice it goes on, not only have a wife of harlotry, but have children of harlotry. Have a children who comes through this adulterous woman. And, uh, and, and everything here seems...